Hi, I'm Roland Sally, and I'm talking with David Ward today on the record, Musicians on the Record. I'm out in California, he's in Maine, so here's a little thing. If I was in San Diego and you was in Portland, Maine, I'd fly to you like stock and bone through hail and falling rain. Over the mountains and down in the valley, just trying to get to each other. Don't take us but a few minutes to get to one another. Huge musicians on the record. Bring it on. So can we talk a little bit about then connecting with Chris Isaac for you, Roland? How did that happen? What's the story behind that? Well, I had been um, living in Los Angeles and I had a band with uh, Pete Anderson, who later became the, the guitar player and the producer for Dwight Yoakam when Dwight first started. And uh, we this is before right before Pete hooked up with Dwight and right before I hooked up with Chris, we had a band, it was a blues band in Los Angeles called the Blue Monkeys and played a lot, you know, uh, in, in the bars, you know, doing the four or five sets, you know, six nights a week kind of thing around Los Angeles. And um, we had a, we had a drummer, well, we had, we had a number of drummers and we were having trouble sort of keeping a drummer and we played this little bar called Omahomies down in Santa Monica uh, every Friday night or something it was. And um, one night when our drummer had been, he was an hour late and everybody was just exasperated and you know, he was, he was hammered when he came to work and stuff. I mean, he was a great guy, I loved him. And he was a drummer to play with, but he just, I mean, he was a bit unpredictable, let's put it that way. Yeah. So we took a break uh, in the middle of the night and, and we, I looked up and you know, there were little tables around there and there was a table over there and Jim Gordon was sitting at a table now. I don't know if anybody knows the Jim Gordon story, but he's, uh, he, he was on the Wrecking Crew. He was an L.A. drummer. He played drums on these boots are made for walking. He, 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 they took him out of high school to, to cut that Nancy Sinatra track. And he was, he was a fabulous drummer, just a natural, really great drummer. And he played with everybody by that time. This was in, the, uh, this was in 1980, I believe. He played with Derek and the Dominoes, John, John Lennon, and I mean, the list goes on and on. Of course. Yes, I know who you're talking about now, Roland. Yeah, sure. great drummer. So he got in the band. He, what happened was, look at, there he was at the table. And so we went over and, and started talking to him. Hey, you're Jim Gordon. And he goes, oh, hey, he's a really nice guy, you know. And uh, so we, Pete was there, and he said, yeah, geez. He goes, I don't know. He said, we're we're going to need a drummer. Looks like pretty soon. You know anybody who might want to join the band? He goes, "How about me?" Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes, I'll, I'll join. He goes, "I'd love to, love to get back to playing." You know, he goes, "I've been, you know, doing all kinds of different things." He goes, "But I, what I really want to do is start playing regular music like regular bands do again." He, he said, "Geez, man, if you want to join our band, we'd be like, we have to pinch ourselves because you." So he joined the band. Well. That went great for a while, but Jim was having problems there, and um, he uh, he kept them pretty well under 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 wraps. But we began to be able to see that he was he was really struggling with something inside himself, and it turned out he he went, he uh, he went and um, he was he was hearing his mother's voice in his head. He had he had uh, schizophrenic things going on and. Jim is still there. He's, he's still around, um, and he, he may hear this. And I don't want to. I don't want to say anything that he that, that isn't accurate, or that he would not like to hear back on the on the interview. But um, he killed his mother. Basically, is what he did, uh, and to try to stop the voices. That is what I what I understood. So that broke up that band, and it, and it was a kind of a yeah, well, it was a broadside, really. I mean, we, we you come in your in your band does something like that. It's really, mm. to say, like massive. Sure. And, um, at that point, I decided that I kind of wanted to get out of Los Angeles just for a while and maybe try to move and get, breathe some different air. And uh, 
the band kind of broke up and I went on the road with Joan Baez uh, in, in 83. And um, our last gig was around Christmas time up in San Francisco. And Maria Moldauer came to the show and uh, she, she was an old friend of mine and we kind of hooked up and started spending a lot of time together. I moved up to, to San Francisco. Uh, and, you know, there was, I wasn't playing music for maybe three or four months and I kind of started to get itchy and I decided to go out to, uh, to a bar one night just to sit in with some friends and I went in and, and uh, sat in with this blues band and jumped off stage and this guy came up to me who I recognized from another couple of years ago when I'd been, I had gone through uh, San Francisco with another musical situation and um, this guy said, well, hey, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I live here now. And he goes, oh my God. He goes, you, you're the perfect bass player for this band. We've been looking for a bass player forever. I said, well, who is it? He goes, well, it's this guy named Chris Isaac. And I said, well, never heard of him, you know? And uh, he said, well, here, we're having a record release party tomorrow. He's cut a couple songs and he's, he's going to debut them at this, this uh, hotel here in town. So I went down and met him and we shook hands and uh, started rehearsing the next day. And that was, I think, in 84. Wow. 1984, maybe it was 85. Look that up. <laughs> Incredible, though. And had you been in the studio recording before any of that, Roland? Well, yeah, we um, we'd done a lot, uh, a lot of different little things in Los Angeles. I'd cut cut some records and a lot of stuff in Woodstock, New York, before I moved before I moved uh, out to Los Angeles. And you know, I'd been up in Canada a couple of times. Uh, traveled around, you know, it, I was 30, probably 35 when I started with Chris. So I'd, I'd had a whole long stretch of musical stuff happen before, you know, before I met Chris. Sure. So, you know, you're working these gigs, you're doing sessions, you're, you're playing with some bands. I'll, I'll go back to Chris in a moment, because certainly I want to talk a lot more about him. What would you consider to be your big break, especially like after you left home at 18 and went for this career in music? Well, uh, like I say, sometimes, you know, it's just an event that seems innocuous and maybe not really, um, not really much of, a, of, of an event at all. But, but it turns out later on, you realize what, what hinged off of that. And the, the band that I had in Wisconsin, it was called Oz. It was a three-piece band, and we wanted to do some recording. We knew Tracy Nelson. I don't know if people have heard of her. She, she was a singer in a band called Mother Earth, and she's, she is a great singer, great blues singer. And she was from Madison, and, and she had moved down to Nashville, Tennessee. So we, we decided we wanted to try to stretch out a little bit, so we wanted to go check out Nashville, and we, we wanted to go down and visit Tracy Nelson down there. So we did, and when we went down, she was in the studio cutting a record in Nashville. It's called, at a place called Jack's Tracks, and which turned out to be a studio owned by Jack Clement. And uh, we walked in, and Tracy was in the, in the studio there, and, and, and there was a fellow named Scotty Moore running the board. And, 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 and I didn't put it together until after we walked out of it. That's Scotty Moore. The Scotty, Scotty Moore. Moore. Scotty Moore. Scotty Moore. <laughs> Scotty Moore. Wow. This is a you know, guitar player. Sure. Very, very uh, you know, humble, uh, you know, really easygoing guy. He was the engineer. He was working the board in there. You know, he he should have been out in the studio playing guitar, but he was, you know, he was probably, you know, I mean, Elvis had had, had gone to L.A. And, and, and had a new band by that time, but but he was he and Jack Clement and those guys were all sticking in in Nashville and carrying on, and um, so. Tracy took a little break, and uh, there was two studios in that building, and I heard some music coming from one of the other studios down the hall, so I went down and poked my head in, and there was two guys in there from New York making an album named Happy and Artie Tron. I said, hey, oh, how's it going? Are you, uh, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're making a record. Oh, he said, yeah, here, listen, this is what we're about to cut. So they, they played a version of, of a song that they were recording, and I listened to it, and I liked them. You know, they were nice guys. Didn't think anything about any of that. We went back up to Nashville, uh, up to uh, Madison, and uh, carried on. Then, then when my uh, Madison band dissipated, and I moved out to Woodstock, New York. So I'm walking down the street 
in Woodstock one day, thinking about getting a sandwich or whatever in the middle of the day. Hey, Rolly, I hear somebody. I turn around, and, and it's Artie Trong. I go, Artie, you're the guy from Nashville. He goes, yeah, and you're the guy from Nashville, too. I go, yeah. He goes, I goes what are you doing? I go, well, I live here now. See, this is the thing. <laughs> if you move someplace and, you, you know, you get into situations, you start mixing around, you get off the couch, and, and you know, that day it was, I got off the couch to go get a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> I ran into Artie coming, what are you doing? He goes, well, we live here and we're, we're looking for a bass player, my brother and I. So I ended up playing with Happy and Artie in Woodstock uh, uh, for a number of years. And you, not many people may have heard of them in, 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 in you know, certain circles, but they're well-known, well-respected, um, excellent uh, songwriters and musicians and, and, and folk aficionados, you know, from, they're from the village and they moved up to, uh, up to Woodstock and um, uh, through them I kind of really got my start, I would say, really to push out into the music, you know, the music business. Um, I made a lot of friends and came across a lot of, a lot of opportunities and a lot of cross-referencing just from playing with Happy and Artie together. We went to Europe for the first time. It was wow. amazing, 1979. Fantastic. When you come from a cornfield in Illinois, Europe might just as well be the backside of Pluto. Right. <laughs> right. It's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, about, it's about as hard to get there. Right. Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, this is one of the things I love about talking with musicians like yourself, Roland, is just the, the wonderful history lesson that we can all get. And if people don't know some of these artists that you're talking about, they're all on Google, so look them up and... Uh, it's wonderful to hear about that. Um, were you guys at Woodstock, either in the crowd or on the stage? No, I, I moved there one year after the big one year after. Got it. Mm -hmm. the shindig out there. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. So if we can go back then to uh, Chris Isaac then. So you connect with Chris. What are some of the first songs that you start working on, whether you're helping writing or in the studio or playing live? Well, we, we particularly we got involved in, in on, on the second record is when the band really, really congealed, you know, and um, I'm trying to remember what songs are on there. I remember, I, I do remember that um, uh, when we went to, we went, we went on the road in Europe early, and uh, we played little tiny clubs there, and there was a little, some little bars that we were playing. Was, well, actually, we played the Paradiso in Amsterdam, and um, the road manager was having trouble finding a, a, uh, a hotel for the band, but I already knew of one from when I'd been over in Amsterdam with Happy Nart, and I said, yeah, I know this little hotel. It's going to cost us a nice round figure, practically zero. <laughs> I mean, it was a real on-the-cheap hotel where the bathrooms were down the hall and stuff. <clears throat> and um, let's give those guys a call because we can probably get in there and we can afford it. We had none of them. We were traveling on a shoestring. Yeah. And uh, so we went in there, and uh, that's where Chris had the record jacket photo taken for the, the second album. It's, it, I think it's called, is it, it's not called Heart, is it called Heart Shaped World? Maybe, maybe Heart Shaped World. Anyway. Uh, there's a good picture in the, on, on the jack, jacket of that cover. Yes, yeah. In the hotel. And, you know, the songs, um, the, the songs started, the, the, my first impression of Chris's songs were that they were kind of a cross between, they were kind of country, but they were kind of R&B-ish kind of, you know. He's, he's not a rockabilly guy. People think he's rockabilly. I, I kind of disagree with that. He can do rockabilly, but um, he's got a, He's got a real funky, swampy sense of rhythm in his guitar playing, and it's it's not country. Although he can render a country song, but but, but uh, he, there was something really different about him that, that that was. It seemed like it was right up my alley because when I was coming up from Illinois, I'd had all the all the blues stuff that that was coming out of Chicago. I heard all that and and, and kind of had it in my psyche and then there was all the country stuff coming from all around there you know on the radio and stuff and so i guess uh i could play kind of blues and country and i you know i could play with i could play bass in a band with no drummer and i could play you know with a drummer because i'd done, done quite a bit of both so uh, i his music was just was really a good mix of stuff for me you know uh, i remember we did a, we did a, a 
Devil Woman by Marty Robbins. That was one of the, one of the first, that was one of the covers that we did. Although we, we mostly did, uh, it was like a song called Talk to Me. We did a song called Voodoo, uh, uh, The Lonely Ones. All these songs, uh, they're, they're not, they're not uh, rockabilly and they're not country and they're not blues. They're some, some kind of hodgepodge of, of, of all of it. Yeah. Of course, his voice is, you know, something you can really get behind. Yeah, I agree. And it does seem like a mix of all of that. It's fantastic music. I love it. Uh, you know, some of the, my favorites are I Believe, uh, yeah. Baby Did a Bad, Bad Thing, of course. Yeah. All of those classics that, that are... That was an interesting song. You, well, we'll talk about Baby Did a Bad, Bad Thing. When I first met Chris, um, after that day in the uh, in the hotel, when, when he said, you know, should we shoot a candy? He said, come down, let's, let's, let's play together tomorrow. So he said, here's where we're here's where I want, want you to come tomorrow at, you know, six o'clock at night. So it was in the really what they call the bits of town. It was the, it was the derelict wharf section of San Francisco. Okay. We, we cleaned it up, but back then it was, it was a wreck. It was a train wreck. <laughs> and there was a row of uh, buildings on, on third street down there that were kind of derelict. And um, he, he gave me the address and I got to the place and it was boarded up. It was, it was an old bar, obviously, but it was, the, there were padlocks on the door and the boards in the window, bars on the window, no paint on the front of the thing. And it, you know, it was just, you couldn't even see in the place. So I'm banging on the door and the door opened and it was just one of those rooms. There was nothing in the room, but, but, um, like dirt, like fallen plaster down off the, off the, the ceiling and everything. It was just, I mean, it was like, it was it was just about two degrees away from being outside, you know. <laughs> you know? So it was my friend Mark Plummer who introduced me to Chris, uh, who, who I'd seen at the bar that night. He says, "Come on!" So we walked to the back of the place, out the back door, and then into the sort of there was a backyard, and the grass was probably you know eight feet tall, just weeds, and there was there were feral dogs back in there and stuff. And we went out the back, turned around, and came back in through the little stairway down into the basement of the place, which was even worse. I mean, it made the upstairs look nice, you know? And uh, it was a dirt floor and there, there had been like leaking pipes, so the dirt, it turned quickly into a mud floor and it was cold and the ceiling was about maybe, maybe five foot nine, you know, you had to crouch down to get through there and there was a room back in there. I went back in there, there was a drum set back there, sitting next to a mud hole. A couple of amps and Chris and our manager, very important guy named Eric Jacobson who, who uh, produced all of the Love and Spoonfuls hits back in the 60s. He um, did Norman Greenbaum's Spirit in the Sky. He did a lot of things. And uh, he, he, he was our producer and manager for, the, for the, a, a good number of years until not that long ago. Uh, uh, you know, he's instrumental in, in, in helping Chris get up and get going. He was a great, great guy to be around, but he was there. Jimmy Wilsey, the original guitar player, was there, and Kenny Johnson. So it was the four guys plus me, and the room was like just damp and horrible, and there was water dripping in, and there was just one little like, dirty light bulb shining the thing. And I looked over, and we were freezing, and this was like March or February in the year. So I looked over, and laying in a mud puddle was an old rusted out heater, electric heater, with no cord on it. So I went over and picked it up and kind of brushed it off. And, you know, if we put a plug on this, plug it in, it might work. And so I wired it up and plugged it in. And sure enough, the little, you know, it looked like kind of like a, kind of like half a toaster, you know, and, and the little wires heated up. And they all looked at me and went, maybe this guy's not so dumb, you know, we want to keep this guy in the van. You got stills. <laughs> and, and they were impressed with that. They got a little heat in the room. But, but when we started playing, it was kind of obvious that we had a, we had a band. I've talked with other musicians who've talked about some of the challenges and obstacles they've had to go through and overcome and ultimately learn some of the lessons from. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those for you? What are some of those challenges, those difficulties in the music business um, that you've learned from and are growing from? Well, the, the challenges are always there. They, they kind of change. You know, people say, oh, once, once you finally make it, everything's going to be sweet. It's going to be easy, you know, but, but that's, that's not true. That is really not true. You, uh, you, you, have, to, you have to lean into this. Uh, 
as hard as you did when you first started, uh, just in a different way. But when, when I first started, the hardest thing was just trying to get fed. I mean, you know, literally, like, I mean, trying to, trying to be able to, you know, to, to keep, first of all, to keep your gear safe and dry, like, and, and, and if, you're, if you're a guitar player or, or you know, whatever your instrument is, it's your instrument. And then if, it's, if you're a bass player, it's your bass, and then it's your amp. You know, you've got to have those two things in good shape. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be able to, to deliver in any, you know, at the drop of the hat. So you got to keep those. So, so almost secondary is, um, is, you know, food. <laughs> you got to, you got to be able to, you know, to keep yourself together and, 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 uh, you know, so you got to keep number one, if you're starting out as a musician, I, I found that I wanted to keep my gear really good and sounding great and safe and, uh, you know, not up for grabs, you know, in any way by hook or by crook. And, um, and then you want to get fed, and then you want to get, get something on that looks, you know, fairly like it's together if you can. And uh, although that's not really that important because, because when you're in the studio, nobody cares what you look like. If, you, if you're laying down a good track, you know, you can be King Kong, you know, in a tutu, no one cares. But um, um, then when you get with people, some of the, oftentimes the challenge are, okay, now I'm in a group of people and we're trying to make a go of this. And who are these people? And who am I in relation to these people? And how are we together? Because once it's, give, it's a given that you're able to play, then you kind of have to be able to hang. You know, you've got to be able to hang out and, and, and uh, cooperate, literally cooperate um, with, with, with your group. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't try to try to stiff arm or hard nose a situation and say this is the way it's got to be. You've got to be able to to form to function as a team. Uh, some people find that harder than others. You know, uh, I'd like to say I'm fairly easygoing and didn't didn't, didn't create haven't created too many waves or too many you know situations. Um, You've got your standards, you know, you just got to try to everybody to collectively keep your standards up and, and do all that. And uh, then you may be going along uh, for a couple of years and you may say, well, this isn't really working for me. This isn't as, as uh, happening as, as big or as, you know, as beautifully. I'm not making enough money or, you know, I don't live in a, in a, in a, I can't pay my rent or, you know, I'm, I've got to stay in a little apartment and I want to I wanna have a room that's some rooms that are bigger. I want to have maybe... Maybe you get to the point where you say, I want to have a girlfriend or a wife and a family. And um, these are some of the sacrifices that, that you might have to make at some point to make a decision. Do I really want to stick with this? Because there are maybe a number of things that are pulling you in, in the other direction. People are talking to you. Maybe you hear something from the past. That somebody said, you know, you can, you're going to really succeed as a doctor or something, you know, just any, any of those influences that are coming around you, you, you know, you see things on TV. Oh, look at him. He's got a great car, you know, or, you know, he's, he's living a fast life. And here I am in this little band. But again, I say, don't give up unless you're really ready to. And even then, put it off until the last possible minute because you could be, uh, you could be out there making big waves somewhere and, you're not, and you wouldn't even know it sitting in your little, little house, you know, because it's not always apparent that you're making it. Uh, stay with it. Don't give up. Love it. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So uh, great advice, especially for, again, up and coming. You know. Yeah. And another thing, when, when, when you finally get to the top, let's say, I haven't been there, but <laughs> I, I can see what it's like. When you finally do get to the top, uh, the food's better, you know, the places that you stay are better, but you still have to have yourself uh, it's you and yourself at the end of the day, and you think, "How did I do? How did I? Uh, how did I? You know, did, did I do as good as I can possibly do? And uh, and you know, have I have I lived up to my stand, my own personal standards, whatever they may be?" Sure, absolutely. And, and that that feels the same as it did when you were when you were fourteen years old. You know, you figuring out which end of the drumstick to play with. You know, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it's all always. <laughs> It's always still us, right? So my, my, my great grandmother at one point she was I think she was ninety one or something, and, uh, and I said, "Well, oh, you, 
when I get to be 91, I'm gonna, I want to be like you and know everything and have it all together. And she said, don't kid yourself. She said, I'm still trying to figure it out. Right, right. Yeah, I love it. Wow. Good, right. Good to know what we don't know as well, right? Or that we don't know things. Yeah. Mm. Can you talk about, Roland, some of the, the differences for you um, mindset-wise, even as a professional, going into the studio as well as playing live? What's different? What's similar uh, mindset-wise for you? Well, the studio, of course, what you finally, what finally makes it on, on the recording is never going to go away. And, and you're pretty, pretty aware of that. So I'm, for me as a bass player, I'm pretty conscious, conscious in the studio of trying to make each note count and not overplay. And also not, I'm very careful about the, about the singer's melody uh, because he can be, be, be executing a melody that lays over a certain, you know, chord or, or, or chord progression. And I can play a bass line that sounds great with that chord progression, but it might not go with what the singer is, is doing. So I'm, I'm always trying to make sure that I don't clash with, with, with the, the, the vocal melody. Try to try, and I always try to try to play a little bit less if I can. Try to subtract out notes. So it's a, it's a, it's a mental tussle in the studio to try to to try to get something that you think is going is going to sound good and hold up uh, when you hear it five years from now or when anybody hears it. You know, it's, and and I always find it simpler is better. Uh, I always make sure that I that I'm. I'm physically comfortable and, and you know, I've, I've eaten, gotten a good amount of sleep, had, you know, had plenty of water. Back in the day, I'd make sure, I, you know, I didn't have too many beers the night before. Just, just try, to, try to go into the studio uh, in as good a shape as you can because um, you might be there for hours. You might be there for 14 hours cutting something. That baby did a bad, bad thing was an interesting, more interesting example of that. Um, but, um, uh, so the studio is, is it's critical, I, I feel, because what you do is, is gonna, it's, it's going to outlast you. <laughs> you know? right. uh, playing live is more of a hoot. It's just more fun. Uh, uh, some bands approach it differently, but our band, we, we, you know, we pretty much roll up our sleeves and just, just go in there and have a ball. And uh, you know, I, have to, I, I tend to play a little more and a little more, uh, 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 you know, Ex, ex, in an extra way, uh, exuberantly when I play, just because it's fun, and I think it translates to the crowd. When you go out in front of a crowd, see, and you've got the whole crowd feeding you energy, and then you feed it back, which isn't the case in the studio. It's all pretty much all in your head. You're just trying to make a make a, a good model that's going to lay lay straight forever. And, and, and live is uh, it's a hoot man. Yeah, a lot of fun. So I don't worry about that. Let's go out and have fun. And our band is, you know, it's a fun band when we play live. Any uh, pre-show rituals for you or the band before you guys get on stage? <laughs> there is, but I can't, I can't put it on this. That's fine. Okay. We, all, we all go like this. We put our hands in right before we go on and go, hey. That's the part where. Love it. Make up, fill in the blank. <laughs> right, right. But we, we, we in a, in a, in a, in an unspecified way and in an un, uh, un, unordained way, we, we all get our minds and our heads all in the same spot uh, for the show. You know, for about an hour before the show, we're, we're, we're tuning everything else out and we're focusing on it as a group in our, in our different ways. And when we come to, come to the stage, we're, we're, we're ready to go. We're looking to have a good time. Yeah, and, and I'm imagining that's your intention of what you want the crowd to be feeling when well, they're we, every guy in our band knows implicitly that every person in the crowd has plunked down some money that they had to work to get and, and they've spent that money on themselves and whoever they've come with and uh taken time to get there park the car walk into the place and uh, and and have a good time I and mean, we feel that like that so we owe them the best effort, even if you got the flu, you just put that aside, go out there and, 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 and throw down because 
because they have, so we will too. Even if there's 15 people in the crowd, I can think of a couple of shows in the early days where, where the band outnumbered the crowd. Mm. <laughs> but we still went with the juggler vein, you know, right. in the situation. But I, I think it's, I think people deserve it. They come to see a show and we actually feel like uh, every show we do is, our, uh, is an audition for the next one. 